Hi, this is Daniel and you're watching Unrivaled Investing, a no-hype, mission-focused channel trying to find you exceptional companies and unrivaled investments. The question that I've been asked is, does Nextdoor belong in my investment portfolio? That's literally a question that I've received today as Nextdoor announced that they are merging with Vinod Khosla's SPAC. And so folks are saying, hey, could this be a good deal? Isn't this a special sort of evolved social network that's focused on the hyper-local, focused on the neighborhood. Could they outbeat Facebook? And in full disclosure, I am a Facebook shareholder, so I wanted to see, hey, could this be the next player, the next evolution of social networking websites that sort of disrupt the incumbents, could grow at significant scale and become a fantastic stock for shareholders? The short summary is, I'm skeptical. That said, let's dive into their business model now. Let's dive into what is Nextdoor. And then at the end, we'll talk about valuation because fundamentally, every stock needs to be considered both on their fundamentals as well as their valuation. That's a key aspect. You can't have just one if you're going to be thinking about stocks in a prudent way. So looking at the deal, Venet Kosala's SPAC merging with Nextdoor, you see you know, effectively a $4 billion valuation here, taking the cash from the SPAC, the pipe where, you know, you effectively have the CEO of Nextdoor investing at the pipe as well. So they, you do have some buy-in with management and it's all going into the company, cash proceeds to Nextdoor and estimated transaction expenses. So this is what I like to see. This isn't about a big payout for some of the, the existing shareholders. No, no, no. This is about paying, enriching the balance sheet. That's what this is about. So that way, maybe they could grow a little bit faster. So right now, it's KVSB st stock, which is the SPAC or Venet Coastal's SPAC. And they're merging with Nextdoor. The ticker when this is done is going to be KIND. Why is it going to be kind? Well, that comes down to their mission statement, where their purpose is to cultivate a kinder world where everyone has a neighbor they can rely on. And they talk about how neighbors around the world turn to Nextdoor daily to receive trusted information give and get help, and build real-world connections with those nearby, neighbors, businesses, and public services. So the mission fundamentally is connecting you to your neighborhood. And the advantage here is that you're looking at verified people. You don't have, let's say, the trolls that you get on social media. You effectively have to say, hey, I can prove that I live in a certain area. Maybe it's a bill. Maybe it's a, you know, a phone statement. It's something sharing like this is indeed where I live and I'm a real person. And when you do that, it creates sort of a trusted network, or at least there's an enhanced level of trust that the data you're getting is better. And then you're going to be getting more and more local data, whether or not it's about businesses, civic engagement, local recommendations, groups, or marketplace. There's all sorts of additional functionality that happens on the hyper local level. And that's really what Nextdoor is trying to tap into, along with this sort of more trusted social network with verified people. That's a key aspect of this. And here, when they say hyperlocal, they mean it. Like they, they have designated areas like, what's your zip code? Oh, you're outside of it? No, 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 you're not gonna be following that news. This is where they are now, which is saying, I live in this designated area, but they're looking to, in the future, roll out additional functionality saying, I live here, I used to live here, my, my parents live over here, I own this business that's over there. And then you can check the local markets in very specific zip codes. But if you, for example, just wanted to willy-nilly check out another zip code, you wouldn't be able to because this is they're trying to keep this effectively a local social network. That's what this is. Oh, I own a vacation home over here. Okay, now you can get this data. That's what they wanna have in the near future. But right now it's, hey, this is the neighborhood where I live. And so this leads to a much higher quality to noise ratio. Than, let's say what you'll see on something like Twitter or Snapchat or Facebook. And so you're getting a better local perspective on potential news with appropriate news feeds. And maybe that might mean, hey, there's been a string of burglaries over here. You know, make sure you to lock your cars or, or make sure your bikes are locked up or something like that. Or local group news, recommendations, connections. Hey, you know, we're new here. Can we, we'd love to meet some more families, make some friends or business recommendations. So you're going to get higher quality to noise because it's very, you know, like you're not going to get people in my opinion, or you're less likely to get people to sort of just put spammy information 
with this because there's a functionality where like, you know what, I might actually be running into this person in the future. Like, I can't say something over, I can't be a troll here. Or it's it's less likely that you're going to get trolls. You, you'll, I'm sure they still get them. You're less likely to get these sort of nefarious actors when you can't hide behind sort of the cloak of anonymity. And you can't just say things out into the universe and make people feel bad without having some sort of recourse. And so this this definitely, by having that sort of authentic users, it does create more of a local and personable experience, I would suspect. And here's where the interesting you know, argument comes is, are they unique or do they have an unrivaled value proposition? And they call out how the number of folks that visit Nextdoor or the Nextdoor app or site on a monthly basis usually don't check out, let's say Snap or LinkedIn or Twitter or Pinterest. So the, you know, if you're looking at these other platforms, you're looking at information that simply that's a different marketplace from what they're looking at. Now they do call out that 27% or about a third of their users don't check out Facebook and, and Messenger or, or their platform and about about 40% don't visit Instagram. And what that really means to me as I'm looking at this is really that means like, wait a second, that means 70% actually did visit Facebook and Messenger beforehand. So it's not 100% clear to me that this is indeed unrivaled like some people might think because I suspect that a lot of folks are sort of saying, well, wait a second, I could already create that sort of local feel by having a Facebook group. And maybe there's some sort of you know limits on who the Facebook group lets in or maybe it's a, a private group or maybe it's a public group and you know with public groups you can you know it, it can get much noisier but it does show you that in my opinion there is likely some competition with facebook here at least on this sort of facebook's efforts to make a local com competition or local uh, marketplace or group perspective but they are saying look we are tapping into huge marketplaces they're predominantly a u.s company now but they're saying look neighborhoods are all over the world and this is an advertising revenue business model hundreds of billions of dollars in potential revenue and they're looking at potential adjacent markets as well such as classified local commerce real estate local events there's a lot of potential revenue drivers as you look at this business model so you could think yeah this business model should have lots of growth in the years ahead they're definitely tapping into something the question is sort of how sticky is it and the challenge is as you as you look at this business the challenge with this sort of very hyper local growth orientation is that you're also going to have much slower growth because you don't have that sort of virality that you're able to get with facebook where it's like oh all college students now you can do it and start off one college at a time but then it opened up saying hey let's let's just everybody and that's how facebook was able to grow so darn fast you know as it scaled up it, it had hyper you know it hyper scaled whereas here it is you know for a company with under 100 million dollars it was growing at 62 percent i think facebook's growth ratios you know growth rates when it was this size of a business were much much higher and we'll talk about that in a minute so this is the downside i'd argue to having that sort of uh authentic you know trusted users um that said you know 50 percent annualized growth that's nothing nothing to thumb your nose at or say hey this is this isn't worthwhile this is still a very fast growing business 62 percent uh in 2019 49 percent 2020 and they're forecasting 40 percent plus growth in the years ahead so there this is definitely a potential of being a great stock in the future if they're able to do let's say 30 40 percent plus growth in the years ahead the question is how much of that is baked into the valuation already we'll talk about that in a second and so what about the valuation because you can't just look at the the business prospects you also need to understand well what's the valuation to drive my returns in the years ahead now i'm going to do a quick plug if you will were if this is your first time tuning in you like learning about potential multi-baggers types of stocks that could potentially go up hundreds or even thousands of percent over time make sure to hit that subscribe button if you're already a subscriber i do appreciate that thumbs up if you want to follow my personal journey see what i'm buying and selling each month, go to unrivaledinvesting.com. First week of the month, I call out my full portfolio once a month, at least once, once a month. I call out a, a potential multi-bagger or type of stock that I think has that type of potential upside over time. I'm ideally looking for things that are unrivaled and or looking for things that have some sort of asymmetric risk reward. That's really what I'd like to see is sort of saying, well, hey, you know, maybe on the downside, I don't lose much. And on the upside, I can make a lot over time and so that's that's how i'm thinking about that but that's if you go to unrivaledinvesting.com that's the exclusive content let's keep diving into understanding next door and the spac that we're looking at and so you know here it is their projections for the years ahead 
I already mentioned they're growing about 40% plus. That's what they're expected. But here's the challenge that I'm seeing with this. This company is really subscale and significantly unprofitable to the tune of a hundred million dollar plus loss per year. Now they do talk about how their adjusted EBITDA figures are less, are about less than half of that loss. Still a huge loss. This adds back stock-based compensation. And you know, I think how investors will value this is off of these adjusted EBITDA margins of about. 40%. That is a long way away from where they are now. I mean, you're, they're saying, look, we'll be immensely profitable in the future, but yeah, 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 we're extremely unprofitable right now. Now, what did sort of strike me as a red flag is they talk about current model does not assume additional capital. I'm thinking, why are you even talking about this now? And they say additional funding can significantly accelerate growth, like maybe make their growth rate even faster. And that makes me a little concerned, like, wait a second, you're doing this back now why are you talking about additional capital or are you talking about this additional capital is going to accelerate their growth? So you're saying the current balance sheet is actually going to make these growth figures even better. So is that the right way that we should be thinking about this? That that's, it just struck me as a question mark. So does that mean more dilution? If so, that's a red flag. Or does that mean they're trying to lowball their growth figures and their growth figures are actually going to be even better because they're going to be using this new cash on their balance sheet, the hundreds of millions of dollars on their balance sheet to accelerate their growth, roll out into more neighborhoods. That's ideally what I presume investors would like to see is, hey, let's actually scale up this business a bit faster. And so this is the challenge now is as we look at this, you know, sort of setup is that, you know, and keep in mind, this is a hypothetical valuation. Of course, stock price could go way higher, way lower. Currently, the stock has popped after the, the news announcement today that they were merging with, uh, you know, Coleslaw's, Vineyard Coleslaw's SPAC. And so now it's around 11.50 per share, which implies around $5 billion valuation. This is, you know, before any sort of cash on the balance sheet. And you can see they grew 63% in 2019, about 48% in 2020, and then modeling out somewhere between 40 to 50% in 2021. That's what that's supposed to say there. And so then what's it look like in the ensuing four years? So what's it look like by 2025? So keep in mind, this on a forward sales multiple is effectively 25 to 30 times sales, just so you understand. So remember that 25 to 30 times sales right now for a company that's growing around 44%. That's what they're saying. Their margins, they think long-term are 40%. I'm, I'm putting a range of 35 to 40% because keep in mind, from a valuation perspective, maybe they shouldn't be getting full credit you know, for those future margins, because they're nowhere near that. But, you know, optimized margins, that's how I'm valuing this thing. It's somewhere between 35 and 40%. Then what's the growth rate in the ensuing four years? Because I like to have a five-year time frame when I look at any prospective investment. And so I'm saying maybe 30 to 40% annualized growth. This is based on their most recent growth figures of saying, hey, 44% revenue. And that, that's based on what they were saying. And so looking at, you know, plugging in a range of, let's say, 30 to 40% annualized growth after 2021, assuming a multiple five years out of 25 to 35 times earnings based on them getting to or at least being valued off of 35 to 40% profit margins, which they're nowhere near now, then you effectively get for a stock price of effectively upside 50%, downside of 35%, over five years. So what I'm looking at is, in my opinion, a very mediocre risk reward. I just see this valuation. I see this, you know, implied earnings multiple on an optimized earnings multiple. And I think the risk reward is pretty lousy to be to be 100% honest. And that's that's part of my value proposition here with this channel is I'm going to be 100% straight with you. If I think something is priced very terribly, I'm going to tell you if I think a business model is not that great, I'm going to tell you. Here's my straight call. I think the business model is super interesting. I think this is being priced extremely richly. Um, and so investors are wondering, well, wait a second, wait a second. Facebook, wasn't that priced pretty richly as well? Wasn't that a super expensive IPO? And you know, based on their growth projections and stuff like that, didn't they still crush it? And investors make like 10 times their money since the IPO. And like, couldn't this be the next Facebook given that they have these different dynamics to them? And to that, I go, wait a second, you need to have some context, please. And this is, in all honesty, this is part of the journey that I feel like every investor should consider doing is that if this is your first time getting into the game, you need to have the context or at least know someone that has the context to sort of say, well, wait a second, what's actually delivered exceptional returns over time? Let's break this down. You can't just say, hoorah, here's my, here's my score and this is why this is a good company. You need to say, what's the valuation that should drive this return in the future? Why is this a good risk reward right now? And so here it is 
context please on could this be the next Facebook? And wait a second, when you look at Facebook, what they did and what, where they went public at, when Facebook went public, it was priced at 15 times forward sales. This is being priced at a significant premium to that. This is being priced at 25 times to 30 times forward sales. So this is this is a huge, this is effectively 100% premium, almost 100% premium to what Facebook was. And keep in mind, Facebook, based on the data, and this is the data, it's a little hard to see, but this is the data from the prospectus when they went public, effectively showing, hey, first quarter 2012 growing at 44, 45% growth rate, which is slightly better than what they're penciling out for, because they're saying 45% here, based on what, it, what, what they actually did. They had put up hyper growth when they were smaller, so growing faster and much bigger than next door. And then they were also looking at Facebook's business model. They were also immensely more profitable at 45% operating profit margins. This isn't some sort of optimized margin figure. This is actual cash flows that were coming in. They were crushing it from a financials perspective. So let's do sort of this exercise to think, well, wait a second, let's let's think about this valuation of Facebook at the time of their IPO, you know, because is, is it possible that Facebook just had, was really super, you know, expensive? And I already called out, well, wait a second, the valuation was half of what you see with Nextdoor, despite better growth prospects and profitable. And so you look at what was effectively implied, doing, doing this sort of hypothetical valuation framework for Facebook at the time of the IPO. And this, this is why, I, in my opinion, seeing these sorts of data points reinforces this perspective that you need to have a framework like this to think like, oh, this is how you, how you potentially get a good risk award. And so looking at Facebook when they IPO, it was around an $85 billion valuation. They had grown the previous year at around 88%. And during that first quarter of 2012, they were growing at 45% about. So in this hypothetical valuation framework, I say 40 to 50% growth for that year. Then in the ensuing four years, I say 30 to 40% growth, assuming a continued deceleration from that level of growth. That is me trying to be conservative of what actually happened. Okay, this is the, like, if this was all the data I had, then this is what you frequently see I do with these hypothetical frameworks of saying, yeah, you know, as a company gets bigger, it's hard to have hyperscale. So you get, you know, you have slower and slower growth rates. So that's what I did, you know, at the bottom um, over here, you know, over here saying like, yeah, this is 30 to 40% growth. I assume their optimized margin of 40 to 50%. Keep in mind, they were already at 45% margins. Now, interestingly enough, assumed a multiple of 20 to 30 times earnings multiple. This multiple is actually lower than the multiples I'm assuming right now for next door. And that does show you sort of the pricing dynamics that you see in this current marketplace environment. And so 20 to 30 times would have gotten you to effectively break even to nearly 200% upside. And the reality is the reason why Facebook stock did better over time was because their fundamental results beat out what I penciled out here. Their growth rate was better than I penciled out. Here it is, I'm penciling out like 21 billion by 2016. They beat that by a few billion dollars. So that's the thing to consider is that you want a realistic framework to consider what's a reasonable range of valuation, what's a reasonable range of growth rates. And that is ultimately how Facebook has crushed it. It was a great risk reward at the time of the IPO, if you had that sort of growth investors mindset of sort of saying, well, what's a reasonable valuation here? It was trading effectively around 15 times sales. So I, I, this, this struck me as super interesting. I'm, I'm glad, you know, I personally own Facebook stock now. And as I look at this, you know, as I'm looking at next door and I'm looking at the SPACs and I'm looking at the IPOs, I'm just seeing a lot of froth. I'm seeing a lot of valuations that just don't make sense. That said, occasionally I'm picking out spots where I think, hey, the risk reward is compelling. It is something that I can conservatively pencil out saying, hey, maybe this does have hundreds of percent upside over time. You know, I do call those out occasionally here on YouTube, but mostly I call that exclusively, mostly, most of the time, I call that out at Unrivaled Investing com for my journey subscribers where I call out one potential multi-bagger a month as well as my my full portfolio in terms of the, the detail there so if this video has been helpful for you understanding the next door stock merging with the SPAC Vino Kosla SPAC please make a point of subscribing if you're already a subscriber I do appreciate that thumbs up thanks so much for watching